I invite you to kneel with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can gather in this worship center here this morning to come in from the cold, to listen to you, to sing praises to your name. God, we thank you that you have come to rescue us, to rescue us from ourselves, to rescue us from our selfishness, and to lead us into your path and into your way. God, speak to us. Speak to us. We come in here today with all kinds of emotions and anxieties and thoughts and situations and circumstances, God. And we need to hear you. And we need to follow you and put into practice what you were saying to us. God, speak to us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. For some unknown reason, I got on a roller coaster a couple of years ago. And I say for some unknown reason because since I was a little bitty tyke, I have never liked roller coasters. Some people do, some people love them. They live for them, that's a big deal. For me, it's not, I avoid roller coasters, I don't like them, I feel out of control, there's a lot of uncertainty there, and when I get off of them, uh, I feel like I wanna hurl. So it's not a good time for me. But I was in Disney World in Orlando and everybody else was getting on the roller coaster, so I said, I'll get on to. It's been decades. Why not? Maybe they've changed them and they're fun. And so I get on this thing and we click, 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 going up. And then we go down and then we go around a curve. We go around another curve, go up a hill, screaming down this big old hill. I am not having a good time. Then we go upside down, which I'd never done before, loop de loop. And I'm like, this is crazy. And then we get to the very end of it and it stops. And I'm thinking, awesome, okay? I did it, I survived it, this ride is over. No, if you've ridden this roller coaster, you know what happens next. They throw that baby in reverse and you go back and do the entire course, the entire rails backwards, which makes you feel great when you get off, right? Right? Still don't like them. But roller coasters, like them or not, are a good metaphor or analogy many times for life. Because I don't know, sometimes life feels like riding a giant roller coaster, doesn't it? It's unpredictable. You're out of control. A lot of people screaming. A lot of chaos. Makes you feel sick sometimes. But especially when we jump on a roller coaster, I call the emotional roller coaster. Emotional roller coaster. A lot of us jump on the emotional roller coaster. You know, when it comes to emotions, it's kind of interesting. Uh, there are basically only four basic emotions, right? I mean, I'm mad, sad, glad, and afraid. Those are the four emotions. Other emotions are subsidiaries, if you would, of those four core emotions. And so we come into this place of worship usually and we're probably dealing in one of those emotional areas. Either we're upset and we're angry or we're sad and we're grieving or maybe we're happy or maybe we're filled with fear. And a lot of times our, our emotional um, state or our, you know, our, you know, how are we doing in life is contingent upon this, what I call emotional roller coaster. So it starts with personal relationships. How are your personal relationships? And if you're connected to someone or if you have kids or, or someone you love and they're doing well, then you're doing well. They're not doing well, you're not doing well. So you go up and down, up and down, up and down, depend upon, depending upon how the other person is doing. Also, politics is another roller coaster, isn't it? 
If your party's in power, you're up. If your party's not in power, it goes down. Something great happens politically during the week, you're up. Something bad happens, you're down. Up and down, up and down. You're on this emotional roller coaster. Or profits, right? The market. It affects so, so many of our jobs and our lives. The market is up and down and up and down. Hopefully it's more up than down, right? But again, it, it, start affects, it affects us. And many times when we're on this emotional roller coaster and we have these circumstances that are affecting us, we make decisions which are really dangerous because we base our decisions and we base our choices off of our emotions. And that's a dangerous thing to do because the quality of our lives depend upon the quality of the decisions that we make. And if we're making decisions and if we're making choices based upon living and riding this emotional roller coaster, then we're in a dangerous and a precarious place. And we're apt to make decisions that are not helpful. We're apt to make decisions and choices that are outside of God's best for our lives. So today I want us to look at how we can get off that roller coaster, how we can make better decisions that puts us in a trajectory to do God's will and God's business in this brand new year, 2021. Now, 2021. I, I remember hearing people the last several months, I can't wait till 2020 is over. Well, well duh. But, but they're saying it like, yeah, when that clock changes to 2021, Jan 1, everything's gonna change magically, right? It's not, right? As you can tell, we're continuing 2020 into 2021, if you've not been around last week. So, if we're gonna have a different life, if we're gonna have a different mentality, if we're gonna not allow our emotions to dictate our lives, our emotions to dictate our decisions, we've gotta get in on what God's telling us. So let's look at Matthew, if you would, chapter 26. Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament. And we're gonna look at what I believe is one of the most intense moments in the life of Jesus Christ. One of the most intense moments in the life of Christ. He has just um, celebrated, if you would, the Passover meal with his disciples and he's eaten the bread, he's drank the cup, and now he leaves the upper room and takes a walk and takes his disciples with him into the garden. It says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, hey, sit a while over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, with him and began to be grieved and distressed. He said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. One other gospel writer says he sweat drops of blood, but he said, remain here and keep watch with me. So we can see here in this gospel in Matthew and Luke and other gospels that the emotional life of Jesus Christ is very very important. It talks about him being an emotional person, an emotional being just like us. At the same time, emotions are overrated. Emotions are overrated. Again, emotions are important. There's Maybe the longest book in the entire Bible, the most chapters in the entire Bible, the book of Psalms, 150 chapters, is a book about emotions. So the Bible talks about emotions a lot. Emotions are very important. Feelings are very important. But many times, especially where we live today, emotions and feelings are overrated. Let's see what happens next. Verse 39, he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup 
pass from me. Not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Emotions are weak. Emotions are temporal. Emotions don't last. Then he went up again a second time and prayed saying, Father, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink from it, your will be done. He came and found them sleeping again for their eyes were heavy. He left them again, went away for a third time, prayed the same thing. Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, let it pass, but not my will, but thy will be done. This, this passage here in Matthew 26 is it marks a transition in the life and the biography of Jesus Christ. Up to this point, he is acting. He is doing things to help others. He's leading, he's equipping, he's teaching, he's healing, he's delivering, he's feeding. He is a man of action. At this point though, Instead of him doing things for others, he allows things to be done to him. He enters into this phase that we call the passion. And that's what the passion means. It's really when Christ, in a sense, surrenders his life and becomes more passive and allows these things to take place to him. Now, there are many layers to the story. Uh, we'll get into some of them as we start our brand new series next weekend and then the weekends to follow. But I will look at one aspect today of this story as it relates to our emotions, as it relates to making decisions according to God's will. First of all, we see in this passage, as you know, this cup. He talks about this cup. He had just drank from that cup, from the Passover cup, a literal cup. Now he's talking about a cup metaphorically. What does the word cup mean? What is he talking about? Well, some people would say that the word cup, if you look in the Old Testament, is talking about someone's fate. This is my cup. This is my lot in life. This is my fate. Others would say, well, the cup in the Old Testament refers to wrath and judgment, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. So that's the cup that he wants to pass. Others would say what's in the cup, it's pain and suffering, it's the torture, it's the whips, it's the physical pain that he's gonna have to go through. That's what's in the cup. So you have all of these scholars for centuries speculating as to what's in the cup. And I think what's in the cup is Christ's knowledge that he is going to have to be separated from the people he loves, his disciples, and ultimately separated from the Father. As he drinks this cup, as he goes to the cross to take upon the wrath of God for us and for all of mankind. So the emotions that are coursing through the body of Christ and his veins are impossible to explain in human terms. He's distressed, he's grieved, he's sweating drops of blood here. He's praying He's talking to the Father because his entire ministry, if you remember, is all about doing the Father's will. Why did Jesus come? Why did God send uh, Christ to this earth? To do the Father's will. To show us the face of God and to show us the face of true humanity. So there's this tension that we feel here in this decision-making process that Christ is facing. His cup was unique. He's drinking the wrath 
of God for all of humanity, for all of mankind. He is anticipating the abandonment, the betrayal, the loneliness that will happen in these next few days. But we all have our own cup to drink. You have a cup to drink, I have a cup to drink. It's not the cup of Christ, it's a different cup. It's a different set of circumstances. It's a different type of pain and suffering and trials. But we all have our cup that we have to drink. Jesus, grappling and dealing with his very real human emotions and yet praying through that and getting to a point where he says, if this is your will, Father, I want to do it. Not my will, but thy will. Not my emotions, but the will of God. You know, this applies to us, I think, in this way. Many ways, we'll look at one way today. Last week, I had an interesting dream. And in this dream, I had a rent a car. It's not a very fancy dream or symbolic dream. Carl Jung would not have very much fun with this dream, but just work with me. So I have a rent a car driving down the streets of Houston. For some reason, I'm driving really fast, which is unusual for me. I'm not really a fast driver. Again, I don't like roller coasters. So, but I'm driving fast in this rental car and I'm, and I'm driving and I'm trying to get somewhere and the roads are kind of wet and the roads are kind of bumpy because we have potholes here, if you haven't noticed. And I'm going over these potholes and finally I go over, you know, you see those signs with the warning that says bump or hump or whatever. And I go over one of those things and boom, come down on the rental car. And when I get back down on the street, Okay, the steering wheel is just kind of uh, to to going to the left. So I'm trying to straighten this car out. I'm trying to drive straight on the road. I'm trying to drive fast, but I can't because this car that I just trashed as I went over this bump in the road is out of alignment, it's simply out of alignment. And I think many times when we are seeking to do God's will when we're seeking to make decisions, many times, a lot of us simply have an alignment problem. We have an alignment problem. And, and, and we're on this emotional roller coaster. We're making decisions and choices based upon our emotions or the emotions of someone else, what we anticipate. And we're, and we're, and we're out of line with God's will. A friend of mine puts it this way. He says, there's an eternal abyss between my will be done and thy will be done. There's an eternal abyss between my will be done and thy will be done. So we need to ask a question about whatever you're facing right now, about whatever challenge is in your life, about whatever choice and decision you have to make. You have to ask the question, is this God's will? Is this God's will for my life? Is this God's will in my business? Is this God's will for my family? Is this God's will for my friend? Not, will this make me happy? Will this make them happy? Not a decision based upon fear, but based upon the will of God. So we need to align our will with God's will. And many times we can kind of detect what God is doing by thinking about this. We can think about, first of all, what are you constantly worrying about? Your worries and my worries are clue many times to what God is doing in our life. What is keeping you up at night? What are you, what are you constantly worrying about? Another clue is, is, is criticism and critique who or what are you constantly criticizing or critiquing? That's another clue 
of what God may be doing in your life and calling you to, to address. Another is your conscience. My conscience. We all have a conscience. We all have a moral compass that God has placed inside of us. What does your conscience say? Is your conscious speaking to you and guiding you and directing you? Or is your conscious telling you that you are out of alignment in this area of your life? You're out of alignment. You're out of the will of God. So what do we need to do? How do we do that? In this new year, in 2021, how do we get into alignment? Or, or to say it another way, how do we jump off the emotional roller coaster of being up and down and up and down and up and down? And how do we go into this garden, if you would? How do we go into this garden with Christ to make better decisions? There are three things that need to happen in our lives when we go into the garden. Three wins, if you would. Three wins, all right? Three wins. The first win is this. If we're gonna put ourselves in a position to hear God, if we're gonna put ourselves in a position to align our will with his will, we need three wins, three wins. First win is this. We need to win the morning. We need to win the morning. I think Tim Ferriss said, if you win the morning, you win the day. So if you can find the time and you need to find the time, carve out time in your morning to get along with God or to get to someone and pray and to read his word. It's so critical that you do that. It's so critical you develop a habit of winning the morning in that way. I realize, depending upon your circumstances in life, that time will change. Uh, the amount of time you can spend with God in the morning will change, but you've gotta do something in the morning to start your day to put you in that place to hear God and to listen to him speak to you through his word, regardless of your emotions. I mean, let's just, let's just compare it to uh, exercise and working out, right? You know, the best workouts you're gonna have, the best walks or jogging or weightlifting or whatever you do, swimming, are gonna be those times this year when you go and work out, when you don't feel like it, when you don't feel like it. You go against your emotions, you go against about what you're feeling like, and you simply make a choice of your will, hey, I am going to do this. It's the same thing with prayer. It's the same thing with reading God's word. It's the same thing with winning the morning. Emotionally, we don't always feel like doing it, but we show up. Jesus goes into the garden in this critical moment in his life to pray. But as we see time and time again in scripture, Christ always was getting up to pray. He's praying in the evening here, but he would get up in the morning and go to a lonely place. He would go to the mountainside. He would get in the boat and he would withdraw from his busy life in order to pray. Now, if Jesus took time, he only had three years to get it done. If he took time, carved out time to pray, how much more do you and I need to take time in the morning to win the morning and to pray and to seek God's face to start the day? We've got to win the morning. That's the first win, to put us in a place where we're aligned with God's will. Second thing we have to do is we have to win the weekend. You have to win the weekend. What do you mean by that? You have to make a commitment to worship God and to be in church and to worship him on his day. Hey, we're already here. We're already here doing it. Check that box, right? We've got that win. We've got at least one out of the three wins right now. You and I, we're here. We're here singing to God. We're here praying to him. We're here giving. We're here to hear a word from him, speak to, our, to us through scripture. But we have choices on the weekend. We can choose recreation, right? Or we can choose to worship. We can choose sports or we can choose worship. We can choose to sleep in when it's cold and rainy, or you can get those bonus points like you do today and show up at church, right? Now, I realize some people, because of what's going on, have to stay home and to protect themselves. I get that. But the weekends, Sunday or Saturday, find that hour, find that two hours to gather with God's people. 
to gather with them. I know that during this uh, pandemic and stuff, we had a time where our church was shut down. We couldn't worship here in the worship center. We did everything um, online. And I would come in on a Thursday or Friday and we would tape the worship service or or eventually started doing it live. But I I would be home on on a Sunday, I remember, and just kind of watching the service, drinking a little coffee, you know. It's kind of, I'm gonna pause right here and go do, you know. It was, and I was thinking, Man, after this is kind of nice, right? I may do this for a long time. But you know, after a while, you know, I just I remember looking over at my wife, I go, you know, it's just not the same, right? It's just not the same. You know, there's something about gathering together. There's something about being there live in person. There's something about community. As Christ said, we're two or more gathered, I'm there in your midst. And again, we're we're putting ourselves constantly in a position to hear from God and to align or to realign our will with his will when we win the weekend. Third win. This is the toughest. Save the toughest for last. Is you have to win the battle of the will. You have to win the will. Oh, for for centuries, for millennia, philosophers and scholars have debated what's primary? Is it the emotions? Is it passion? Is it reason? Is it the mind? Or is it the will? Our ability to choose our ability to say yes and our ability to say no. We have to win the will. We see Jesus in this watershed, epic, historic moment entering into the battle of the will. And he lays down the the human side of his will and said, God, if there's any other way we can get redemption done, I'm for it. And he's dealing with his emotions and he's processing all of this, but he's in the garden. He says, God, but not my will, but thy will be done. And what is that? That's surrender. That's surrender. That's trust. That's letting go of of, of feelings and letting go of emotion and letting go of the future and saying, God, you've got this. God, I turn this over to you. I surrender this to you. I surrender them to you. And we turn it over to him. That's surrender. That's surrender. I think about Paul, and I know we looked at this a few weeks ago in here. Uh, I think about Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the thorn in the flesh, right? Three times he prayed, remember? Three times, God remove it, no. God remove it, God said no. Third time, God remove it, no. But God says, Paul, my, my grace, my power is gonna get you through this. I know you're feeling, feeling weak, but in your weakness of emotions, my power, my grace is gonna be strong in your life. As Paul knew that secret, didn't he? Of surrender, surrender, surrender. Not my will, not my will but thy will be done. What's this all about? It's about getting off the roller coaster 
and going to the garden. To hear God and to do his will. Let's pray. God, we are imperfect people. We are sinners. We're broken people. We're needy people. And you have provided a way for us to be forgiven and to be set on a new path. And yet, God, even when we're walking on that path, there's so many times, so many decisions in life that we have to make to stay aligned in your will. God, we want to do that. that that's, a, that's a desire you've placed inside of us. God, we want to do that. And God, I know that it's your, your primary will for us that we experience the, the life and the new life and the new hope and the reconciliation and restoration that you have for us by trusting in you. And God, there's some here today, I pray that need to stand and walk down front and to do that today and say, hey, as we start this new year, I wanna turn my heart and my life over to God. I, I want this new life, this born again experience that, that God has for me. Lord, I know there are others here who would say, Hey, I, I've, I've experienced God, I'm, I'm born again, I know Christ, and I'm, I'm simply looking for a church home, a place where I can grow, or a place where we can grow as a family, and to be encouraged and nurtured in your word and your will. So Father, I pray for, for Christ followers here as well who need to stand and walk down front and say, hey, today's the day that we're joining, today's the day that I'm joining this community, this church, in this brand new year. God, we give this time to invitation. Lead those who need to stand and respond.